very big thanks to Jennifer Biddle for her time and effort in setting this up. Um, I also should make sure to thank uh, the NSF Tektron Pyre team, like I mentioned before. Uh, it's a large team of people that are uh, collecting uh, various aspects of um, these uh, Chinese hot springs. And I should also thank the staff at the Yunnan Volcano and Spa. Um, I don't usually get to use spa in a uh, scientific talk, but uh, we didn't use the spa. We were, we were sampling. Um, and this was funded uh, through NSF and NSF China. So really, before I get started into some of the seasonal changes of these extremophiles, I'm going to start at a fairly broad scale. If my slide changes, there we go. Um, Earth. It's an amazing planet whose processes are both affected and is affected by life. Now, many of us are aware of the plants and animals and the role in the environment, um, but really to understand how life can support, or how Earth can support life, we need to take a closer look. Not just at this ecosystem level, or at the local level, but really we need to go down to that micron scale level. While microbes are usually too small to be seen with the naked eye, their activities affect things like our lives, our food sources, and global processes uh, such as climate. And really, I've always been amazed at how such small organisms can have such a large impact. This is a large area of your research, trying to figure out how microbes are assembled into communities and how these communities affect different ecosystem processes. In addition, how do the conditions of that particular ecosystem feedback to the microbiology and how they affect the microbial uh, communities? So really, a fundamental question to understand this particular loop is how do the, the microbial communities, how are they distributed, and how does this occur with different seasons? Now, we're uh, very familiar with how certain plants and animals change their appearance or behavior with different types of the year. Uh, say, for example, a tree that loses its leaves or a bear that hibernates during the winter. But really, what do the microbes do? Do they change their activities? Do the abundance changes? Do they show seasonal changes? Well, we have an idea in several environments, such as oceans, that they do show these changes with different seasons. But there are several uh, environments where we don't really have an understanding of this fundamental question. One example here is a hot spring, mainly because um, well, a hot spring is where water has been heated through geologic processes and expelled upon the earth. And because of this, we have a assumption that because of these geochemical processes are um, created or developed by deep earth, um, processes deep within the earth, not by the orbit of the sun, that they really wouldn't change with the season. There has been some studies despite this, but mainly the assumption has been that light intensity would be changing. Um, and so they've looked at photosynthetic maps and seen how the light intensity would change. And so they've looked at uh, a comparison between a tropical, where we really don't see much change in the solar radiance, versus a temperate, um, where we would have uh, much larger changes in solar radiance. And uh, these studies have used uh, methods like DGGE and clone libraries. And really what they found is something kind of interesting was in the tropical environment, these phototrophic mats actually changed with the season. There were differences in some of the geochemistry as well as some of the uh, microbial communities. When you go to a temperate environment, such as Yellowstone National Park, um, they didn't see these particular types of changes. The location might change a little bit where these uh, mats are, but the microbial communities really did change. And even when they artificially um, reduced light intensity, they still didn't really see a change in these microbial mats. So really there's a large knowledge gap. There's only been a handful of these uh, studies. <clears throat> and such as, you know, what type of microbial communities in, in the water and the sediment, not just the microbial mass, how are they changing? Can they change with different seasons? What if we go above 73 degrees where photosynthetic life is no longer 
um, uh, can be supported. You know, can we change those? Uh, does the season change those particular communities? And what happens if we use a high resolution molecular analysis to really dive into that uh, much more rare biosphere than, say, DGGE or cone libraries can? Does the rare biosphere also change? And of course, there's only been a handful of these locations. Like I mentioned, Yellowstone National Park is where most of this has been done. Uh, there's been some done in the Philippines and even in the Colombian Andes. But there's only a handful of these locations, and so it makes it really hard to extrapolate out um, to global environments. So with these knowledge gaps in mind, what we did is we took a trip across the Pacific. I wish all flights were that fast. Uh, to China. So notice we have India being pushed up into Eurasia here, creating these Himalaya mountains uh, and the Tibetan plateaus here. Then over here on the side in southern China, we have these folds that are being created because of this um, tectonic environment. And we get a lot of geothermal activity in this particular area. This is Yunnan Providence and this Tengchong in particular. I'm going to show you one particular area here, uh, Ruhai. This is a national park. It gets about half a million visitors a year. Uh, there is, uh, it's granite hosted. We're going to go to a couple of these different um, springs. This is an acidic spring, 2.5, kind of small. Uh, temperature range between 50 and about 68. Not too far from there, it's a circumneutral uh, temperature or spring. Temperature is about 98. This is one of our hottest springs. And then if we go down the mountain, by the way, we had to hike up that each time we wanted to do more sampling, uh, is another acidic spring. This is pH about 4.5, and temperatures about 70 degrees. Not too far from that is uh, Kumin Chen, which had a very high flow velocity, um, also a circumneutral uh, pH. And then just down from that was this um, pregnancy well. Uh, they would have people drink from that if they wanted to get pregnant, uh, although it did have arsenic in it. And we go all the way down to the bottom to this particular site, uh, circumneutral, uh, high temperature, had these really nice uh, white streamers. So we're going to go to another area, not too far, but this is more of a carbonate-hosted system, uh, so a different chemistry. This particular site, Gangoshe, was actually right within the city. This is looking outside my window of the hotel room I was staying in. Um, this was a, since it was a carbonate hosted, the pH was closer to 9 to 10, uh, also a fairly high temperature uh, in the 80s. Um, this was just kind of a smattering of the different types of springs that we went through and sampled. And one of the first things that we did was you know, the question is, what kind of microbial communities are here? There really hasn't been much work done in these particular springs. So we went through, collected the samples, and did just some uh, pyrosequencing on uh, the various samples. And uh, at a broad scale, we noticed that really these uh, communities are clustering based off of both temperature and pH. So in this group one, we had a high temperature, neutral to high pH was dominated by a particular Alcophacaceae. If we go to group two, which was in that second area, Rudian, uh, within that city, uh, this was very uh, diverse. Most of this was biological dark matter. Uh, we only know of it because of the sequences that we were able to get from there. Uh, we don't really have a whole lot of cultured representatives from this particular area. Uh, and then we had two different groups here. Both of them had that low pH, uh, pH around 2.5, but they separated out by having a low temperature uh, or between 55 and 64 degrees or a high temperature around the 85 degrees. The low temperature here had another Ocophagaceae, a different genera than what we found up in group one, and the high temperature had a, uh, a lot of crinarchaeotes in there. So on a broad scale, we're just kind of seeing that uh, these form very nice, distinct groups, and that temperature and pH had the highest correlation to these particular groups. Like I mentioned before, we kind of interested in, can there actually be seasonal changes? 
Well, Tenchong, it's a tropical area, has two seasons, a wet season and a dry season. In the winter months, uh, it's fairly dry. You don't get a whole lot of precipitation. But then in the summer, we get the monsoons that come in, and we get quite a bit of uh, precipitation. Um, trust me, I was in most of that rain. Uh, the soda radiance really doesn't change a whole lot throughout the year. I'm going to go through and explain uh, a sampling in January, also one in June. I'm going to briefly talk about a sampling that we did in August, um, but mainly I'm going to focus on this comparison between January and June, between a, a fairly dry and a fairly wet uh, season. So um, several people uh, have gone through and measured the uh, geochemistry uh, from right next to uh, where we sampled the microbiology. So we were able to see how the geochemistry is changing. And a, a typical question is, if there's going to be changes in the microbial communities, there should also be changes in the geochemistry. So what I'm showing here is a hierarchical clustering of sites that are um, based on the change in geochemistry from January to June. So these black ones increased in June. The white ones decreased in June. Uh, some of the gray ones really didn't change much. If we look at the ones that are increasing, some of this potassium, calcium, sodium, uh, dissolved organic carbon, a lot of this stuff is typically higher in the surrounding soils and the environment than a hot spring and it seems to be increasing. If we look at some of the stuff like iron and sulfate, they're typically decreasing. These are typically higher concentrations within the uh, spring itself, and they're decreasing in June where we get that higher water. So this is really our first inclination that uh, we might be getting an input from rainwater, that really these springs are not uh, independent from their surrounding environment. But this is the, the geochemistry, so I'm going to move over and start talking about uh, the microbial communities. And to measure these, we use the phylochip, which is a microarray technology. It has probes on it um, for 16S RNA genes. Uh, the latest version that we were using, the G3, has almost 60,000 known taxa, probes for known taxa, uh, with uh, a little over a million different probes. So each of those taxa has redundant probes on there, um, and there are slight changes, so we can tell not only what taxa is there, but some of the closely related taxa uh, from that particular probe. This has an advantage. Because we're putting our DNA on there, and the detection of this DNA is not dependent on its concentration, um, we can dive much more deeper into that rare biosphere than, say, um, some of the sequencing methods where we would have to sequence a lot more to be able to get to that same level. Of course, the down advantage is that um, we're only going to be able to detect the taxa that are on that particular probe, or uh, the probes that are on that particular uh, microarray. So, uh, we went through, and we were actually using this. We were able to identify an additional 54 bacteria and 11 archaeal phyla uh, than what we did with the pyrosequencing earlier uh, that I mentioned with the uh, uh, plus one paper. Uh, so we greatly increased the biodiversity that we knew of in these particular springs using this. And I should mention that the pyrosequencing, um, you know, we had a fair number of reads. Uh, 10 to 15,000 um, reads per uh, site. Um, so we could probably uh, do a little more sequencing, especially if we started using the Illumina platform. Um, uh, we can get in more into this rare biosphere and detect more of these phyla. Uh, we were able to detect with this phyla chip almost 5,000 different taxa, which is um, you know, not as diverse as, say, a soil sample, but it's fairly diverse. Uh, for hot springs. So let's uh, dive into the results of that. Um, first, I'm going to show you the community structure for January. What this is is a non-metric multidimensional scaling where samples that are really close to each other, they have similar or very, uh, very closely similar 
uh, microbial taxa within that particular site. Ones that are very far apart from each other had very different microbial taxa. This is all based off of the uh, phylochip uh, detected taxa. In January, we found that we found three very nice distinct groups. Again, based off of temperature, so groups over here had typically a higher temperature. pH, uh, this is iron. These are the low acidic sites, uh, which is co-correlated with pH. Um, so all these uh, had higher iron. Uh, the reason pH is not significant in this, because we do have two of our very high temperature um, acidic sites over here. Uh, so pH isn't significant because we do have some low pH environments right here. Um, and then this group, too, was mainly from uh, that second site, Rudian, which was carbonate-hosted and had more magnesium in those particular sites. Uh, but we did see that temperature had the highest correlation uh, to this community structure with an R squared of about uh, 0.36. Now, if we contrast this to what we found in June, we're not finding these very nice, distinct groups. Um, it, it was very hard to actually point these out, pull these out of there. And we're actually seeing a little difference in the geochemical control, or at least the ones that are correlated to this community. Temperature is no longer significantly correlated. Uh, in fact, pH becomes a significant correlation um, uh, with an R squared of 0.54. And some of those high temperature acidic sites, uh, they're found a little bit closer to those other acidic sites in this particular um, plot. So the community structure is changing. There's something that's either obscuring the true community structure or really um, it's just a crapshoot that they're all just kind of intermingled within this particular uh, time sample. So we wanted to take it a little bit deeper and take a look at what actually microbes are changing uh, for these two different times. So what I did was a conical correspondence analysis. Um, really, we constrained that first axis to show the variation in time, January versus June. Uh, all these, the square or the crosses and the circles are uh, taxa that have been detected. The circles are archaea, the squares are bacteria. So everything over on this left-hand side was found either in higher abundance of January, or if it's circled, they were only found in January. If it was over here on the right-hand side, uh, found in higher abundance in June, or only found in June. If you notice very quickly, uh, all of the archaea that was found in June were also found in January, but there were much higher abundance in January. Uh, the abundance seems to decrease in June. We also, in June, had a much higher diversity of um, microbial taxa found there. And if we start pulling out what these actually taxa are, most of them are these soil or mammalian fecal-associated taxa, taxa that we would not typically um, considered to be adapted to these high temperature environments. They're more of a low temperature or um, uh, soil type environment. So if we go back, let me refer back to this NMS here where we had these, uh, this kind of a, a random assortment and we're getting these more of these soil type microbes. If really, if rainwater is coming in, bringing external non-endemic microbes into the rainwater, that, and putting them into all of the springs, that there would start to obscure this uh, community structure. And so we're really starting to see that um, these microbial, these hot springs are not uh, independent from the environment, and that uh, maybe these seasonal changes that uh, we could be seeing are simply because of um, the rain washing in uh, certain types of microbes. Let me briefly uh, talk about August as well, where we're seeing the same sort of uh, thing, where January, these are actually Illumina sequencing pre um, uh, OTUs. January, there is 80. Uh, in June, there is 87, so a few more in there. But then in August, there is a whole lot more of OTUs that were only found in August, 
285 OTUs. And just remind you, August is near the end of this rainy season. So if there was microbes and they're just constantly being delivered into this um, hot spring, we would see more in there. So the question comes, where, where are these additional microbes coming from? So this last sampling trip, what we did is we uh, thought, well, if rainwater's uh, coming in, uh, we should look at the soil and see what type of microbes are in there and do a comparison between that and the actual hot spring. So uh, this here is Gumin Chen. Um, it's a high velocity um, uh, spring. Uh, there's a lot of water going through that. Uh, there's soil right near here. Here we are um, removing some of the vegetation um, and collecting the soil. That was uh, pretty close to that. Um, there was really no conduit, uh, visible conduit at least, of uh, rainwater washing into this particular spring. Um, so uh, we went through and did a daily sampling for five days of this particular spring and then sampled uh, two uh, soil uh, sites. I'm going to show you another NMS here where um, for this particular site, we're not really seeing any differences. Through those five days of having high rain and low rain events, uh, there was a little bit of variability in the community, um, but really not ever going close to what we found in that particular soil. And of course, this was a high velocity um, uh, spring, and so if there was anything going to that soil, maybe it's not actually... Um, or coming in from the soil, maybe we're just not being able to see it um, at that particular time. So we also went through and sampled a acidic site. Um, uh, DRTY stands for Durant Chu. Uh, this was a small pool. Um, this is a one liter bottle. Uh, it had about 50 milliliters of water in there. And it was situated right underneath this cliff. So this is uh, looking down underneath uh, or looking down from the top of the cliff. And what we did is took a soil transect away from that particular cliff. Uh, during the high rain events, we can actually see this erosional feature uh, and we can see the water going through uh, this particular channel and dropping off of the uh, cliff and into this particular spring. So this one, so this one had a visual um, uh, we can actually see the rain going into this. And uh, here's the actual spring here. Um, most of it is just kind of bubbling up. It's very acidic, so it has a, a sulfuric smell to it. Uh, we did have to be careful walking around there. There was a lot of these little springs in this particular site. Um, and there's a lot of other debris, uh, organic material coming in, uh, these leaves that are uh, coming in from there as well. So interestingly, uh, when we looked at the community there, we saw three different groups. One was the soil, uh, which was expected, and this is the transect away from uh, that spring up above the cliff. Uh, when we had a low rain event, the spring was typically at 69 degrees, um, and it had a low volume of water, 50 mils or so. Uh, and so and that formed a nice tight group over here on the right. When we had those high rain events, we can see water going into it. The temperature decreased to about 48 degrees Celsius. The pH remained the same, about 2.5 for both of these. And so there was this one time period where we were able to sample on both uh, before and after of this high rain event. And um, interestingly, this community quickly recovered within 24 hours uh, went back to this original uh, community structure. If we look at uh, what uh, microbes are in there, the soil, we found these typical soil ones, the actinobacteria, acidobacteria, and some of the proteobacteria. Um, if we looked at the high rain event, we had some of the same proteobacteria. We also saw some uh, cyanobacteria. They're actually being, um, these. both of these were the dominant uh, phyla during this high rain event. Um, 
Interestingly, 69 degrees is pretty close to where photosynthetic life can actually uh, still do photosynthesis, 73. So maybe dropping that down to 48 degrees allowed uh, for cyanobacteria to grow up a little more. In this low rain event, um, these, the Ocophocales and the Crinarchiota, these were the ones that we would typically consider to be um, a uh, hot spring type microbe that are adapted to these uh, hot uh, environments. And so we wanted to take a look if really the abundance of these are decreasing with uh, increased rain or that they're being diluted out. You know, why is that? The pH isn't changing, the temperature is changing. So I can run another NMS, but instead of this time, I'm just going to show you the genera or the taxa that fall within the Ocophocaceae and the Crinarchiota. Um, so there's this hygienobaculum, a generous within Ocophocaceae, found over here. That's the ones that are typically found in these uh, acidic environments. Uh, we have the hygienothermus and hygienobacter found over here in these um, more alkaline type environments. And pH was the most significant variable that um, correlated with this uh, distribution of the Ocophocaceae. Temperature was not significant within this range that we measured between 50 and 93 degrees. We also notice, um, well, there's some of these other ones, iron and the sul um, uh, sulfate that are co-correlated with pH, but also this phosph phosphate, ammonia, and nitrate, um, hygienobaculums found along these, which indicates that they can uh, handle a variety of concentrations of these uh, particular um, uh, elements. Or, uh, and crinarchiotes, uh, again, pH was a significant variable. Uh, Sophobales, they're typically found in these low pH environments. Um, then we have some of these thermoproteales, desulfocales, um, found over here in the more of the high um, pH range. Interestingly, I do want to point out this candidate vision SK213. We found one over here in a very high uh, pH greater than 9. Uh, sorry, I should point out these contours are actually pH contours. Uh, so um, if it was found on this other side of 4.5, it was just slightly the pH of this particular taxa was found typically in a pH less than 4.5. Um, and so this SK213, we had one found in a high pH and one in a very low pH. Um, I suspect with higher sequencing resolution, uh, this particular candidate division will split up into uh, more uh, divisions. And so um, if the pH wasn't really changing, uh, why would these two particular ones decrease with lower temperature uh, in this particular low high rain event? Well, we should keep in mind that uh, this was based off of Illumina sequencing and its relative uh, reads. So we really, um, these other ones may have increased in um, relative abundance, but these may have not have changed at all. So in summary, um, you know, the phyla chip was able to detect a significantly more phyla than any of the previous reports, uh, especially in this Tengchong um, environment. We are seeing some temporal differences, not only in the geochemistry, but also in the community structure, but likely because of this rain event uh, pulling the soil microbes, these non-endemic microbes from the soil and putting them into uh, the particular hot spring. And so there's a number of questions that still remain that we're actively uh, trying to pursue, such as really does the abundance of Ocophaceae and the Crinarchiota change? Uh, so we're going through and doing quantitative PCR of these uh, through this uh, time series. Also, are the non-endemic microbes active? Um, are they actually surviving in this environment? Or if they are, how does the change in the activity of the endemic microbes, how are they changing the activities uh, during these uh, high rain events? And so we're uh, in the process of doing a metagenomics and a metatranscriptomics uh, analysis of these particular uh, springs. 
So understanding the microbial distributions and the effect of environmental conditions, in this case wet versus dry, it's really a necessary start and, elite, uh, and leads us to the next step in understanding how activities are altered, which then can lead back to uh, global uh, cycles. And so with that, I would like to thank everybody for your uh, attention, and uh, we can try taking some uh, questions. Thanks, Brandon. That was awesome. Thank you. Clap. So I am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 or just like Francis clapping. I'm using Daniel's on their left. Hot sea, big spring. All right. So. Uh, do you want to? What? Who's moderating? Jen. Yeah. Do you want to ask a? I mean, I can put us. I can put us like video. Your can, mic is on. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go to Minnesota. Do you guys have a question? If they're missing anything with Phylogen, then they would see this. Well, Julie just Julie posted, just posted um, uh, did you uh, ever did analyze my in the rainwater, rainwater itself? Uh, yes, we do have samples of that rainwater. Um, and hopefully this next this next deluminous sequencing will be able to get that to work. Uh, we ran it before and something happened. We weren't able to get uh, the actual um, results from that. Um, so stay tuned. Hopefully we'll be able to look at that as well. All right. It said there's uh, some more chats coming in, but why don't we just have everyone uh, raise their hand in the chat room to ask a question, and we might have some questions coming in from Twitter also. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah, yeah. Here, come talk. <laughs> Sorry, we've got a bunch of people in the room here. Hey, Brian. Hey, um, I was wondering, do you know? The uh, like you know people that live in that area do they you know during the cold seasons or do they normally use something like coal or, or wood to heat their homes? I just didn't know if that might contribute to like acid rain. Um, maybe that could affect pH, um, you know, soil runoff, things like that. Yeah. Um, so uh, as far as China is concerned, um, this is a fairly uh, pristine environment. Um, Although there's still uh, Yunnan, uh, not too far away, um, there's uh, Tenchong, um, you know, a couple million people there. Um, it's not like Beijing's um, air quality. Um, so we really don't have, see much of a difference in the pH. The pH of the rain, uh, when we measured it going through that soil, that soil had a lot of uh, sulfide in it just from that particular spring. And so the spring water or the rainwater is going through that soil, picked that up. Before it even got to that spring, it was still a pH of about 2.5. All right. Thank you. Cool. All right, so you've got a question from chat from Daniel Bond or someone at Minnesota. There's apparently <laughs> 10 people in the room there. So as we were running, if you could tell the low temp community came from the soil or was clinging to life in the spring, waiting for the temp to drop. Also, Lori wants to know how much you have to drink from the well to get pregnant. <laughs> um, if you could tell the low Yeah, so I think the proteobacteria that we're finding um, in that particular uh, spring did come from the soil. Uh, we're going to go through and do a little more of a uh, phylogenetic analysis and uh, so we can tell uh, just how different uh, phylogenetically those proteobacteria were. Um, based off of the classification, they were down to the same classification. Um, so I would suspect those are coming from that particular, um, from the soil. The cyanobacteria we really didn't see those in the soil all that much. Um, and so they might just be in there kind of cleaning on to life and hoping for that temperature to drop. This particular spring, um, you know, in the high rain events, it comes quite often. So I can see them uh, just waiting for that particular right condition and then growing uh, greatly. Um, 
and how much to drink? Uh, you know, I think it was just supposed to be a cup, but um, there was a lot of arsenic in there, and so <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> All right, so speaking of arsenic, Mike had just asked me via chat that you mentioned arsenic, and now you've mentioned it twice, so it has to be real, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so is there evidence for arsenic transformations in these systems? Have you seen anything specifically for arsenic processing? Yes, uh, and so we've gone through and um, did this PCR for um, the arsenic uh, reductase gene um, uh, I'll, uh, I'm forgetting now. Uh, Gung Wu at the uh, China University of Geosciences in Wuhan has been doing that, uh, and we, they do have uh, some of the genes. Um, some of the uh, um, elemental mapping and stuff that we've done, we really haven't seen a whole lot of that. Um, so right now, I can say that they seem to have the potential to be able to uh, do some of the transformations at least. All right, we had a question come in over Twitter. Has any of the geochemistry data shown any changes that might suggest changes in function for the microbial community in August? Uh, so we're still kind of looking at the geochemistry from August. Um, you know, basically, we're still seeing the same sort of trend uh, with uh, more of the soil uh, type of geochemistry coming into the uh, springs. Um, there seems to be a decrease that might have been kind of because of um, uh, it, at the beginning of um, the rain event, we're going to get a lot more um, uh, erosion um, or picking up more of the erosion, but then that might die off a little bit. Um, we are there are people that are looking at these as far as uh, rates. Uh, we've been trying to do more of a carbon and nitrogen uh, rate measurements. Um, those are still pretty preliminary in trying to get the killed controls to work in the right way. Uh, so uh, I'd say stay tuned for the rates. That's kind of where we want to go with this. All right. Does anyone else on the chat or on the Internet have a question for us? I don't see anything else coming in right now. So, oh wait, oh, no, we're good. <laughs> All right, well, I think what we'll do right now is thank Brandon for his bravery and being the first person to do this. And uh, if you had a good time, please email us and sign up to give a talk and tell your friends and neighbors to join us next time. So thanks, Brandon. We'll give, every, give you claps. I think there's an <laughs> app to do that, possibly. And uh, we uh, definitely appreciate you being the first one to run through this. Well, thank you. I appreciate you getting this set up and um, letting me be the guinea pig. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. All right, here, we'll give you the Google Effects claps for you. Congratulations. <laughs> At least you didn't hear this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. All right, thanks, Brandon. That was awesome. Thank you. All right, thanks, Brandon. Bye. 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 Another large group there. <laughs> Killing me. Look at Jeff. You can't put your phone down. Yeah. Back to you. All right. Bye, guys. <laughs> yeah.